I'm good. How are you? Hello. I'm good. I'm good. We are in the world of Zoom now with um, plenty of participants with us. Um, so welcome to everybody watching. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give everybody a little bit of background before Yaz and I have um, a good old nerd off and a chat uh, about her music. Um, and yeah, it should be a really, really fun hour. So welcome to the craft of composition with Yaz Ahmed and me, Tina Edwards. Um, if you're not familiar with the Ivers Academy, it's a professional association for music creators, songwriters and composers and they host two awards, the Ivan Avellos and the Ivers Composer Award. So we're going to have about 45, 50 minutes um, together chatting with the winner of the Ivor Novello Award for Innovation, Yaz Ahmed. And then we'll have about 10 minutes Q&A. Um, so please do use the Q&A panel on the bottom of the screen and we'll try and answer as many of your questions as we can towards the end. Um, so keep them coming through at any time as the questions pop into your heads. So a little bit of background on our fantastic winner uh, Yaz Ahmed. She has led ensembles all over the world from Algeria to Canada to the Ukraine. She's performed with contemporaries from Radiohead through to Leap Scratch Perry and since her debut in 2011 called Finding My Way Home, the momentum just hasn't stopped climbing. In 2015, Yaz performed a suite called Polyhymnia inspired by courageous women for the Women of the World Festival with the new Civilization Orchestra. In 2017, we had the critically acclaimed La Saboteurs, which then received the remix treatment with three celebrated producers. The following year, Yaz reimagined Saturn from the Host Planet Suite and was commissioned by the Open University to write a piece inspired by the moon. A Shoal of Souls provided the coda to La Saboteurs in 2019, inspired by the illustrations in part of Sophie Bass, which she had done in response to Yaz's own music, creating a cycle of creativity. And the release itself is dedicated to the thousands of lives lost in the Mediterranean Sea by those trying to find a better future for themselves and their families. So more recently, Polyhymnia was released on Ropadog Records over in the States, adapted from the suite that she performed in 2015 on International Women's Day. And Yaz hopes that her music can build bridges between cultures and change perceptions about women in jazz and people of Muslim heritage. She's been the recipient of many awards, but nothing quite like the Ivan Novello Award for Innovation. So that's enough from me. Um, yeah, so you must be so thrilled. <laughs> yeah, I'm over the moon. Um, I never could have imagined this ever. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I'm, yeah, I'm really, really happy. Very, very grateful. Um, yeah, it's such a nice way to end the year, um, you know, after so much sort of... Uh, yeah confusion <laughs> so yeah it's really lovely and thank you for the lovely introduction that was very nice <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure you know I'm I'm really off sort of success after success and a, and a lot of them will go into great detail on so we'll talk about your compositions um we'll talk about your influences which are so um unique and really I think at, at the forefront of your music and fascinating to talk about um I sort of just dive into your musical world a little bit um but I saw a picture of you with the award in the woods I think and I wondered if that's where you found out like tell me a little bit of the story of, about how you found out the news <laughs> so okay so okay so how I found out um was I received an email from the Ivers um Ivers Academy and um, when I read the email, um, I automatically dismissed it. And I thought, you know, this, this must be one of those where they say, oh, we'd like you to apply to be nominated. You know, you get these things. Um, so I just thought, oh, whatever. And um, I had to send it to my partner and my manager just to like, make sure that this was actually for real and yes it turned out that it was <laughs> so because it you know it doesn't sort of um it doesn't fit my narrative about myself so um it was quite a shock um but yeah once I got used to the idea I was obviously very happy and um and welcomed the award um and yeah that photo is I know it looks like in the woods but it's actually at the back of my garden 
lush. <laughs> but um, yeah, all those logs. Um, yeah, they were kind of they're rotten. Unfortunately, yeah. we found them, and <laughs> we've been uh, forest managing our garden because it has turned into a little bit of a, a forest. So we're just we've been chopping down trees that aren't very big, but <laughs> oh, that sounds <laughs> so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> our, our own little um yeah sort of place of peace and quiet and I think that's something that I've really um enjoyed um is reconnecting with nature during this um this period of pause um so yeah I suppose that kind of represents um what's been happening really this year being in nature and finding that peace and you mentioned um, something which I don't want to let pass. You said that winning the award or receiving that email didn't fit your narrative. What, what do you mean by that? Um, okay, so I think with, um, I don't know, for me, I feel like I'm not doing anything special. I'm just being me. Um, and so, you know, I just think to myself, well, why, why am I receiving this? I'm just, you know, little Yaz making music and, you know, so that's why I didn't really fit into, you know, I don't think of myself, you know, very highly, but whereas maybe other people see me as innovative, which is um, such a great compliment, but yeah, so that's what I mean. Yeah, it doesn't fit in my head, but maybe it will now. <laughs> really? I mean, what, what does the word innovator mean to you? Yeah, I suppose, you know, I, it's it's somebody who do, does something that's sort of that different, you know, outside the box. And I think that's what I, well, I do, I suppose, you know, I mix many different musical genres. I try different techniques, you know, I'm, I'm very open-minded with music. You know, I like to work with um, not just jazz artists, but um, electronic artists and, um, you know, Arabic music and, art rock you know I played in my uh, my sister's heavy metal band a few months ago so <laughs> um yeah so maybe that's what it is you know I'm open-minded and I like to embrace all these different musical elements and make something new awesome and you know the fields that you talk about like um you know with, with sort of looking at uh, Bahraini music, at jazz, electronic music, you're working with producers, you've, um, you know, created a couple of pieces of music inspired by space, like these are, these are things which on their own might not be all that unusual, but the, as the bringer together of these themes, it is extremely unique and, you know, I sort of wonder how far ahead do you, do you plan your creativity almost, do you sort of think to yourself, oh, I really want to do something with space in the future or I really want to go in this new direction or is it only in retrospect that you sort of realize the concepts that you've worked with? Yeah I mean it all just happens yeah in retrospect I suppose. Um, a lot of these pieces have been commissions so I've already had a, a sort of idea you know beforehand um, but you know I've always wanted to create uh, music that expresses um, my own personal voice and my mixed heritage um, and it's just finding a way how to do that and, you know, and adding lots of different colors and, you know, I've always been interested in um, space. So it's really nice to have, you know, those commissions come in and, you know, it has um, opened my eyes to other techniques and other ways of finding inspiration. I remember when I went to um, the Open University to, um, to find you know inspiration for my piece um they they took me on a tour and i got to hold um you know rocks from the moon um mm -hmm. they also showed me little um um uh, segments from um a comet that uh, from mars so i had a piece of mars in my hand and a piece of the moon in my hand and it was just you know mind-blowing so yeah, <laughs> that's, that's great research right there. Um, because I, I wonder, you know, with, with that example, I guess you, you've given me an idea. But when you're generally working with a commission or maybe your own piece of music, how do you get from a blank page or you know a soundless room to the final composition? Do you have kind of like a set way of finding your creativity, or does it vary from project to project? Yeah, it definitely varies from project to project. Um. 
So a lot of the time it's, yeah, there's a lot of experimenting. So um, let's see. So my most recent um, composition um, is called A Moment To Be Free. And um, that was inspired by um, nature um, during lockdown. And so what I did um, was I recorded the bird songs in my garden um, just on my phone. And I took these recordings and I put them into Logic and played around with them, tried to listen for sort of natural grooves um, and little melodies that I thought were interesting. And so I, I chopped up these little passages and also transcribed them. So I wrote down on, uh, on paper. Um, and, you know, all of these, this bit of the, all these bits of information formed into, um, you know, the idea um, and many other ideas. And I made a groove out of the, the bird songs um, and then wrote a, a melody on top. So yeah, that's, that's an example. Um, yeah, so I like to play with, yeah, field recordings. They're a really good way of um, finding um, inspiration that maybe you wouldn't normally, um, you know, think about. Um, you know, like the natural um, sounds of, yeah, nature or being on a train. Um, I've written down rhythms of the, of the train as it's going along. Um, yeah, um, and then other ways that I compose, sometimes I'll write down lots of different melodies, just like, like two bars each of, of lots of melodies. Um, and, you know, they may be terrible, but I'll write them down and revisit them and get rid of the, you know, the rubbish stuff and, um, yeah, and have a look at what I like and try and make something out of them. Um, and other times I'll sing and write down what I'm singing or just bash about on the piano and see if anything happens. Yeah, so it's all experimenting, yeah. Cool. I wanted to talk to you about your approach to melody because I think, you know, there's songs like um, The Lost Pearl in particular and La Hanel uh, Monsieur where I can really hear a great um, ear for melody because these are real like earworms in these tunes that really stick with me. And I know as well, you know, you sort of explore um, like blues notes in, in Arabic music and, and I think you do have a great knack for a catchy hook and, and melodies. And I wonder if you have a particular approach to that, you know, to that single sort of compositional um, area. Yeah, definitely. So um, for those two pieces that you mentioned, um, Basically what I did is I picked um, an Arabic mode that I really liked and I improvised. So I'm already, you know, uh, composing on the spot and um, I'd stop myself if I remember something that I really liked and I'd write it down and then continue improvising and using that little idea and expanding it. So yeah, those melodies in particular are from me just improvising. And yeah, the blue notes in, in Arabic music, you know, they're very special. Um, yeah, they're, they're quarter tones. Um, yeah, I see them as the very kind of emotional human sounds. And um, for me, they're very hard to play on, on my instrument, um, but I did have a um, quarter tone flugelhorn made, um, especially for a commission I had um, for the LSO Sound Hub scheme. And, you know, that opened a whole new world of colours and options. Um, yeah. That must have been so cool to have an instrument that, you know, probably feels so specific to your interests and goals musically of where you want to take melody and to know that you've got this tool now that will enable you to do that. It must have been so liberating. Yeah, definitely. And very hard to get used to because you have to kind of retrain your ears and, um, you know, on, on the trumpet or on the flugel or any brass instrument, you, you know, you um, form the notes with your mouth. And uh, usually if a note is out of tune, you automatically adjust it. Um, so I had to stop myself from doing that when playing the quarter tones and I had to kind of um, just blow through the note and um, accept that that's what it sounds like. And, yeah, it's a different way of thinking. Um, but yeah, it's a great instrument to play. I don't play it very often, um, but yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's definitely more of a um, an emotional instrument. I think more expressive. Yeah, 
those quarter tones, that blows my mind. The idea of having to retrain your ear to look out for those teeny different influences. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Really, really, really admirable. Um, and I wanted to just go back a little bit to the, to the, the compositional methods because uh, it was the uh, Women of the World Festival in 2015. That was the first time I saw you perform with the new Civilization Orchestra. And it was after that, that I was reading about polyhymnia and apparently you went into this sort of intense period of creativity. And I just wondered if you could paint us a picture of what that looks like for you. Are you kind of shut away? Are you busy researching? I mean, it sounds like project to project, like you said, it's quite different, but polyhymnia is such a huge project that I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like to put that together. Yeah, so um, for me, it was a real, um, yeah, educational um, project um, for myself, um, because the women I had chosen, a lot of them I'd never heard of before. Um, so yeah, I started by researching um, inspiring women, and those are the women I felt that really resonated with me at the time. Um, and I just felt, yeah, I want to share these um, women's stories, um, you know, they've really changed the world. So yeah, they're important to, um, yeah, to, to write about. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of research um, just by reading. And then I, I kind of went on a sort of a deeper level and um, read about um, maybe the music that um, surrounded them when they were growing up. Um, and I also had to think, you know, of different ways of, of making each piece, you know, unique and different. So I got some inspiration from, um, there's a, um, an album called Different Trains um, by Steve Reich, and he um, transcribes um, people's um, voices and making melodies out of those voices. And so that inspired um, the idea um, of how the piece One Girl Among Many, dedicated to Malala Yousafzai, came about. So that piece is um, inspired by um, some of the quotes that I felt were very strong um, in her speech that she um, recited at the um, United Nations in 2013. So that was a different way of um, composing for me. And um, it was really interesting what came out. Um, you know, I think the whole, the whole project was very outward looking um, for me rather than kind of inward looking. Yeah, so it was, yeah, I think I had six weeks to write this whole suite. And yeah, I just shut myself in a room, I wrote out a plan. Um, I didn't, it was really hard to, um, there's so much music to write, I didn't want to get stuck. So I planned everything. So I concentrated on one piece one day and then the next one on the other, just so I didn't get stuck and, it, you know, the music didn't flow. Um, yeah, and I'm so glad I got it done in time. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so it's six weeks for six pieces of music. Yeah, yeah, basically. Oh my God. Yeah, before the first rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> Were you waking up in the middle of the night just with melodies in your head, seeing sheet music? I can just imagine it was all consuming. Yeah, it really was. Um, I was shut in my in my little spare room um, in the house and um, my partner would bring me cups of tea and uh, make sure I was happy and still awake. <laughs> Bless you. Wow, what process. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the way that you talked about um, with the Malala track, you know, using that Steve Wright inspiration, um, was it the, the sort of the rhythm of her speech that you used? Is that right? Yeah, um, it's very interesting, the rhythm of her, um, yeah, the way she recited her speech and um, the rises and falls of her voice, it does feel very melodic. And so I thought, you know, it felt very natural to turn her, her um, words into melodies. That's really cool, because I think, you know, to take not really an influence, but a, a person um, and to figure out how to orbit around that person and then create a piece of music about that person you know it doesn't I couldn't I can imagine it's easy to get an idea of someone um but to actually translate that into a, a piece you know a stunning piece of music is it's such a long journey and amazing to have gone through that six times you know in six weeks so 
it's quite something. Um, yeah. let's, let's talk about a different release because on um, Las Saboteurs, I know it, there's a kind of, um, just to, to borrow a quote from your, from your site, you said there was a kind of embodiment of this inner destroyer. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about that. Mm. So um, a lot of creatives um, um, and non-creatives, I suppose, um, everyone has this um, inner voice that tells them that they're no good. Um, and, you know, it can be very destructive um, to oneself. And, you know, this is a, um, you know, this is my anti-muse. And I wanted to recognize this voice and um, sort of, uh, yeah, um, give it a, a sort of a body, you know, make it a character so that I can recognize when these negative thoughts come in. And so I can, you know, recognize them and then also um, dismiss them and say, oh, that's my uh, saboteur talking, please go away. I'm trying to write music. So um, it's been quite a, um, yeah, a journey. It's a really great way I find for me to, um, yeah, help my creative process to, it's kind of like, it's weird. It's um, this voice is not only telling you that you're no good, but it's because, um, you know, she doesn't want you to fail. You know, we're scared of failing. So she's also kind of keeping me safe. Um, but, you know, to succeed, you have to fail. And, you know, so I have to tell her to go away. So, yeah. That's something I think we can all take inspiration from. The idea of, you know, taking that negative self-talk that we have, that negative monologue in our head and actually attributing it to some kind of thing or person yeah. that's more than, you know, separate from our yeah. own minds in a way. Um, but that must have been quite, a, um, from not going too deep, like a really, um, how to put it, like a lot of self-growth and a lot of confrontation in doing that because, you're not trying to ignore the negative voices you're giving it full amplification and you're saying to those voices right I'm here and I'm listening you have my full attention what's up and then you create a whole piece of work from it like the the confrontation and bravery and courage to do that is huge I can imagine it was quite um quite an experience to actually write those compositions yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I even made a little sketch of her as well, which is quite scary. I won't show you. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just it just it's a method that I felt really um, useful in uh, controlling yeah the negativity. And yeah, I hope that other people can relate to that. Um, and you know, also maybe using that method is helpful in. Um, you know, sort of getting away from the, the negative voices and yeah, finding the positiveness. <laughs> I'm inspired by that. I don't know if I'll end up writing music, you know, like you, but I'm, I'm inspired to, you know, put, I think we're all inspired, you know, to put a, uh, a sort of embodiment to that negative self-talk that we get sometimes. Um, you mentioned drawings and I really want to talk to you about the illustrator Sophie Bass because you do have a really tight relationship and and it again is a further sort of example of the various ways that you are influenced and inspired because you know talk about space and electronic music but actually it's illustrations particularly from Sophie that have been a really like big part of your music as well tell us a little bit about what it's like to to work with Sophie yeah so Sophie is amazing um she um she was uh, recommended to me um by uh, my friend Charlie Jungle who um signed me to name records um to release Les Saboteurs and we were looking for artists and he um he mentioned Sophie and showed me some of her work and I thought that it was very powerful um and so how we got together was um I sent her my music just um the rough um takes and um and I wrote down uh, my feelings and thoughts about each piece sort of like poems and she took all of that in and yeah and created something from the music and the words I gave her and I think she represents my music really well and you know you can you know really see all those elements of um you know um, everything just comes to life, you know, you can see proper little stories in her work. Um, and yeah, like you said earlier, 
I've been inspired by her work as well and yeah composed a shoal of souls um, and if you look at Le Saboteur's, um, the actual front cover, it's uh, the, the woman is actually, yeah, Le Saboteur's, my uh, inner destroyer. And she's, um, she's very evil. She's pulling down um, a person, drowning a person, and um, she's already eaten some fish. There are some skeletons there. And yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic uh, representation of, uh, yes, the evil lady. <laughs> It's amazing, you know, I sort of admired it at, at face value for, um, you know, just the colours and the, the composition of the illustration and, and um, you know, being two dimensional, sometimes you don't, and this, you know, this is just off the top of my head with my thoughts, but sometimes with a two dimensional illustration, I don't always get lots of layers from it, but actually thinking about it and preparing for today, I was like, it is powerful. It's really like it, this kind of whirlpool, like it's very relatable and um, there is depth and there is lots of little things going on with these snake-like things, you know, above the ground. And yeah, she's got a lot of depth to her, to her drawing. It's very talented. So I can see how you guys sort of bounce off each other. It's great. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really exciting. So I think, you know, there's, there's so many more um, compositional things that we could sort of, talk about as well and I'm sure we'll sort of um, dip onto them but I just want to quickly refer to your relationships with producers um, and those collaborations because again we've touched on the electronic music being an inspiration and I wondered if you could just tell me about um, working with producers to create remixes of songs has it been easy to find those people that you want to work with and how much of a collaborative vision is it or do you sort of hand it over and say right show me what you've got yeah um well yeah again this is charlie my friend who um yeah gave me the idea he recommended um a load of um djs um producers and you know electronic artists that i might find interesting and that might um you know um create something really unique from my own music um and so i did a lot of research and listened to everyone on this list um, and, you know, it's really wonderful. I discovered so many new artists and a lot of the music I thought that I wouldn't like at all. I suppose maybe I was quite snobbish, I suppose, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've, I've discovered so many wonderful people and, you know, there really is a proper, you know, skill in writing electronic music. It's not just you press play <laughs> or something or just run it through a machine. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, the musicians, uh, the producers that I chose, um, I felt that their music really resonated with me. And so what I did, yeah, we got in touch and um, I sent them all the stems from um, the track or the tracks that they were interested in um, reimagining. So the instructions I gave was, yeah, basically think of it as a reimagination um you know create something that um, represents you but also obviously keeping some of the elements of the um, original compositions and you know I was so delighted um as to what that they all created every remix that has come out from uh Le Saboteurs and Polymnia have all been really stunning and very elegant and you know I'm I'm so happy so pleased you know and yeah, I hope that I continue these relationships. I hope so too. I mean, some of the, the remixes have always, you know, been entering my sets on, on the reg. So, and I absolutely love the, the reimaginings of them and how they work in, you know, brand new spaces. Um, they're brilliant. Um, there was one thing I wanted to ask you actually, just to rewind back to the compositional side. Um, misophonia, with that track, which I love, I know that, the meaning of misophonia, I know this because one of my friends has it, um, it means the hatred of sound and particular sounds will um, set you off and, and cause an awful um, reaction uh, of jerk, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, um, yeah, just a, an awful uh, behaviour. I think for um, for her, it's knives and forks on plates. She finds it hard to eat out of it <laughs> because it, it, she wants to explode if she hears it. Um, and I thought hatred of sound, 
as a title to one of your songs, there's got to be something in that. And I wonder if you could tell me why it's called that. <laughs> Yeah, so there's obviously, yeah, there's different layers to it, obviously. Yeah, there's the um, scraping of plates, people gonna eating in your ear. Um, but then there's it also kind of, yeah, the deeper level is, you know, the sort of, um, I don't want to use, I don't know what the best words to use is there's not self loathing, but when um, we as creators, you know, when we create, we have a lot of doubts, and we start to sort of dislike what we've created and sort of convince ourselves that nobody will like it um, and it's all a load of rubbish blah 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 and so I think that also kind of represents that sort of um, yeah um, hatred <laughs> of uh, yeah one's own creations yeah do you learn do you learn to love them afterwards is it kind of yes. sort of separate yourself from the process and be like hey this I, I've done good I've done all right here <laughs> yeah it takes a while it's a process that's what I found you know you write a really great um tune or whatever and you're really happy with it and then when you revisit it you think oh dear that's why did I write that it's terrible and so yeah it's a big process um but yeah you eventually get there and you're eventually happy <laughs> How, how do you manage to get there? Are there sort of certain people that you trust creatively to, you know, speak with you honestly, or is it a more sort of internal thing for you? Um, yeah, it's a bit of both. So I would say um, for me, leaving things to breathe. Um, so just don't, um, don't listen to those ideas. Don't look at them for maybe a week and come back to them. That really helps. And it sort of, um, um, before you might have hated it and now you've lived with it you decide actually this is great I'm going to develop this um, but yeah my partner um, he I trust him completely and I'll play something to him and I'll say what do you think you know do you think this is all right and you know he he won't lie to me so that's that's really good um, he'll say if it's good or not and he sometimes um encourages me and um yeah so that's really helpful um but yeah I do find what's that do you guys have a similar taste in music yeah yeah we do um and we also learn a lot from one another you know he um, introduced lots of different types of music to me and same um, with him I mean he actually was the first person um who um, inspired me to um, look into Arabic music and rediscovering my um, my Bahraini roots. So yeah, I feel like I, I owe a lot to him, you know, for that. He started me on this journey. So yeah, I'm very grateful. <laughs> and you know, that's such a huge thing as well in terms of influences in your music. Tell me what it was like to, to you know, sort of immerse yourself in Bahraini music and, and to work out the ways that you wanted to bring it into your own music? Yeah, um, well, for me, um, it made me feel really whole, you know, revisiting that music um, from my childhood, because I, I grew up in Bahrain till I was nine and moved over to London. And, you know, I left that part of my life and just um, adapted to, you know, British culture and, um, you know, I felt very British. Um, but as I started growing up, I, um, I felt that something was missing. And, you know, when everyone gets to their late teens, I think everyone wants to find their own identity. And for me, um, yeah, I didn't know what that was until maybe my early 20s. And I realized actually, you know, I should really be embracing my um, mixed heritage. And so, yeah, that was the time where I started to relearn Arabic. Um, and uh, I got a load of books from the library about Arabic music and, yeah, and that's when I, I started experimenting with um, Arabic scales and rhythms and yeah, I started to feel whole. So it's been a very personal journey for me, definitely. Awesome. And I guess that's how the flugel horn came around as well, right? The quarter tones and accents. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the Soul of Shoals because we haven't dipped into this release um, uh, enough today. Um, 
it's about, um, and you'll tell us plenty more, but loosely it's about, uh, or at least dedicated to those who lost their lives um, and are still losing their lives looking for something better as they cross the Mediterranean seas, um, which is such a powerful thing for us to be talking about. And I wonder if it's created conversations, your music, that you're just thankful that you think maybe those conversations might not have been had or you might not have seen, you know, people sort of bringing these things up with their loved ones if it wasn't for your music. I wonder if, if any of these, you know, conversations or stories have, have come to you. Um, yeah, I mean, after some gigs, I've had people coming up to me and saying, thank you so much for, for bringing up these points, you know, nobody really talks about this. And um, so that's a really positive, positive feedback for me. Um, but yeah, this piece, um, it's, it's also, um, you know, I found the inspiration through um, reading about Sufism and the music um, associated with Sufism and, you know, we know about the the whirling, the whirling dervishes. So I was thinking about whirl, um, whirling and twirling, and also of the sea. You know the rough seas, um, and you know um, and the unfortunate um, events that occur. Um, yeah, throughout you know the crossings and stuff. And um, yeah, I think people get that message, and I think people are very grateful. Um, yeah, for somebody maybe I don't know bringing this up. Mm. And that's how music is most powerful, I think, when it enables us to communicate things that are difficult to raise, or mm. at least, you know, we can communicate feelings that we might have just with the musical language um, is, is so powerful. So I'm really happy to hear that there's been, you know, sort of um, progressive and positive conversations that have come from it. Um, let's take this moment just to just remind people that they can send over some questions as well. So we'll be going to those in about 10, 15 minutes as well. If you've got anything on your mind, just use the Q&A box um, at the bottom. Um, now I just want to take it way, way back in terms of the first time you picked up your instrument because we've dipped into the, comp the compositions, which is the perfect place for us to start the Ivan and Bellows. Um, but in terms of you becoming one with your instrument, can you tell us a little bit about when you took up the trumpet? Was it in Bahrain? Was it in the UK? Like, did it feel natural or did it take a little while to build a relationship? Mm. So um, yeah, in Bahrain, there were no opportunities to learn musical instruments really, which is um, which was a shame. My mum, she did buy me a recorder and uh, I have uh, four sisters so uh, we drove my mum mad trying to play <laughs> recorder together um, <laughs> so it was quite a relief I think for her <laughs> when I started to learn the trumpet but um, yeah so when we moved to um, London that's when I, I began playing um, my um, the school I went to and they were offering musical instrument lessons and I um, I chose the trumpet because uh, my grandfather, uh, my mum's dad, he um, was a jazz trumpet player in the 1950s. He played with um, John Dankworth, um, Tubby Hayes, Ronnie Scott, and um, also became um, a record producer as well for Pye and Phillips. Um, records and um, yeah so for me he um, yeah I found him very inspiring he was my hero and yeah so he he started me off on it um, he gave me my first ever trumpet lesson and I loved it you know I fell in love with it from the start um, just you know hearing those notes um, coming through this shiny instrument um, yeah it was very excited I was hooked from the start how old were you when you took it up? I was nine. Nine, wow. So I'm imagining like a nine-year-old, yeah, as amongst four sisters, you know, buzzing through the little the little thing, probably, you know, just sort of trying to spit through, creating these tones, and then, you know, suddenly finding a different tone to what your sisters have been, have been playing with. Must have been pretty cool to find your thing. Um, did your sisters take up instruments as well? Did they stick yeah. with it? Oh, they did, yeah. Um, so Iman, she learnt the trombone. Um, Nadine, she learnt um, saxophone, Nadia, French horn, 
Dina flute. Um, and my mom started learning as well. She started learning the trombone and euphonium. Nice. So um, it was a very noisy house. <laughs> but, um, you know, we got so much enjoyment out of playing these instruments and going to youth bands and, you know, um, going on um, tours. You know, it's really, really fun. Um, yeah, so I'm really grateful for um, to my mum who kind of, um, you know, begged, borrow and stole to to uh, afford these lessons for us. So, yeah. What a legend. Um, <laughs> it feels like, you know, we're talking about you as a student, but I can imagine you clearly have a really hard working ethic. It, it shows. And I think that, um, or at least you can tell me, I imagine you might feel as if you're always a student of something, um, as a lot of musicians do, you know, the day we stop learning is, is you know, a sad day, really. Um, and I wonder if you do feel like a student of your craft in any particular areas or that there's new things that you're sort of focused on and new things you're learning. Yeah, yeah, like you said, yeah, we're always learning. Um, for me, I'm learning more and more about the um, uh, technology side of music. So, um, during this um, period of uh, lockdown, I got a commission from Adult Swim. Um, and so I had to create this music on my own with no other musicians. So I learned how to do programming in Logic um, and recording at home. Uh, my skills have improved in those areas as well. So yeah, the music technology side is something that I'm definitely learning more about and um, I'm really intrigued about as well. I also created my own remix, which I've never done before. And that was such a challenge, um, you know, and I've got so much admiration for these people who have created remixes from my music. Um, yeah, so I'm still learning. Yeah, I'm always learning and always discovering new music. I can understand though that remixing your own music must be harder, not to discredit. <laughs> Producers, you know, um, that's not where I'm going with this, but to remix your own music because you know it inside out and you probably have um, an idea of just in muscle memory, you know, what comes next. And then suddenly you're, you're cutting and splicing and moving these areas around. It must be so hard to like take 20 steps back and look at all of the structure and all of the components with fresh eyes. Yeah, it was very hard, but luckily um, it was in collaboration with my producer and partner, Noel Langley. So I, we had a different, you know, approach and, um, you know, compared to one another. And so um, that was really helpful, having a fresh pair of ears, which also inspired me to create um, new uh, melodies and, you know, out of all of that stuff that we recorded ages ago. Um, it was quite difficult. But um, yeah, I'm very happy with the results. It did take a while and a few sort of um, conflicts <laughs> of musical tastes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, but we got there in the end. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's something I'll do again. I'm not sure, but it was definitely a, a good learning um, curve. Nice. Um, and I wonder, you know, sort of speaking compositionally over the 12 months, we've talked about ease and field recordings and getting to know different um, programs. Are there any other ways that this sort of quiet time has affected you creatively or, or compositionally for the, for the better or worse? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I've been writing in different ways, definitely. I've um, been writing for different um, instrumentations. Um, yeah, more trumpets. Um, one of the um, tracks that I uh, I composed um, had, well, during this period, I think it had five trumpets um, and lots of programmed stuff, which was, yeah, really fun. Um, yeah, I've definitely been more creative um, this year, which is, um, yeah, I'm really grateful for that. And um, yeah, yeah. Step I guess, less distractions, a little bit more focus where you want to be able to put it can you yeah. know be a good thing um we've got some questions coming through so i think let's let's dive straight into some of them we've got some really good questions um douglas is asking what your future plans are once we're all out of the covid crisis yeah um everything's all up in the air at the moment um you know uh well last year i was supposed to be touring um canada and um america brazil and all over europe 
and Tunisia, and that was all cancelled because, understandably, because of COVID. Um, so next year, it's all a bit mm, unsure. You know, we have some dates um, with my my band booked in, but a lot of those dates are already being moved to November next year. Um, so um, we'll see. It's just there's so much uncertainty, and um, but um, yeah, people seem to be a bit more optimistic. I've noticed because of the vaccine. So um, hopefully um, we can yeah get music out there to people, um, even if it's just streaming. Um, yeah, and I did a couple of those streaming gigs um, last month, which was, yeah, very strange um, having no audience in, you know, in the room and, you know, needing that reassurance that, um, you know, that maybe we did a good job or maybe we didn't. It was, it's very strange, you know, finishing a big number and then there's that deadly silence and, um, yeah, <laughs> weird experience. <laughs> It's a weird tension of like, you know, you're sort of highly involved in making the music and it comes to a, an end every few moments and you sort of wait, the applause sort of breaks the tension, I guess, or yeah, it does. And, and refreshes you to start on the next the next direction so it must be quite, it must be quite strange. Um, but it goes to show the importances of audiences because I think as an audience member we can all go along quite humbly you know we're there to see the star we're there to see the really talented musicians play and actually you know we, we should give ourselves credit as well for like being a part of you know creating a dynamic that you feed off of us just as much as, as we do in a way yeah yeah um, definitely it's a conversation um and you know we yeah I really missed that I, I didn't you know, I wouldn't have thought that that was such a, a big part of playing live or seeing music live. But yeah, there's, you can't really recreate that with um, streaming performances. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, whoever has a, you know, a mystic ball that's watching, feel free to let us know what the next year looks like. <laughs> um, Alice is asking, um, when working with Radiohead, was there a mutual learning experience? Oh, um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I know that I learned a lot from them, actually. Um, I learned to take myself more seriously. Um, when we, when uh, my partner and I, he played Fugal as well as I on the um, King of Limbs album and on the live from the basement session. Um, yeah, they, they were so serious and so focused on their work and, you know, it really made me think, gosh, I should, I should be like this. Um, and it was really lovely in the recording session. Um, uh, Johnny Greenwood, he was playing us music that they were inspired by. And one of the artists they were inspired by was Alice Coltrane. And that was a real surprise for me. Um, and, um, you know, it was really nice to make that, that relation, um, yeah and share that that music with them and yeah it was yeah it was a really wonderful experience and yeah I won't forget that. Cool I'd love to ask you about the other collaborations as well briefly because you've you've worked with so many um people in the live front Does, I wonder if that question you know applies to anyone else in your mind of a mutual learning experience. Mm, yeah I suppose so um I mean, I think maybe people who don't usually write for trumpet, um, um, you know, maybe there are some things they didn't know a trumpet could do, or maybe the things that trumpet players, you know, can't do. And so, you know, they're learning from um, a writer's point of view as well. And, um, but I do like it when people challenge me and um, ask me to play something that maybe I couldn't play before. And, um, you know, it gives you, um goals to um you know achieve um yeah i mean yeah i'm always learning um, when i played with um these new puritans and when i've worked with my lovely friend jason singh i'm always learning about electronics and that's what inspired me to buy a chaos pad and you know um find all these new colors that i never thought that you know my trumpet can't re can't create on its own so that really opened up a, a whole new sound world for me. Yeah, always learning. Cool. Um, keep the questions coming in. Um, something that I wanted to ask you as well, actually, um, was there's this quote which kind of 
pops up here and there when I'm reading about your music um, from you, which is, I hope that through my music, I can bring people together, uh, building bridges between cultures and changing perceptions um, about women in jazz and people of Muslim heritage. And it feels like a mission statement. And I wonder if, if that kind of resonates with you. Is that something that you're you're quite sort of um, focused on in, you know, creating conversations around those things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, like I said before, yeah, identity is very important to me and bringing up issues, but in a um, sort of, um, in a gentle way that people can, um, you know, uh, receive um, in a, yeah, yeah, in a gentle way, definitely. And, you know, I suppose people's perceptions of, um, you know, people of Muslim heritage. My, my father is a Muslim, he's Bahraini. Um, you know, you don't expect to see, um, you know, uh, Middle Eastern woman, women playing musical instruments and playing jazz. Um, so I think, you know, that I'm hoping that that's inspiring to others who may be like me. When I was growing up, I didn't have any role models. And it was really hard for me to... Um, you know, identify um, and see myself becoming um, a trumpet player. You know, there was uh, there was no one, and then I, I did discover a couple of female trumpet players eventually. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, because I didn't have these role models, I did have that feeling that oh, maybe women don't or girls don't become trumpet players because I'd I'd never seen any. Maybe that's just not a career option. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do hope that, um, yeah, younger people who are similar to me can find, you know, maybe some hope or inspiration. Um, yeah, the sort of inspiration I didn't have when I was growing up. Awesome. It's so important, isn't it? We, we aspire to what we can see reflected back at us. So if we don't identify with someone that we can see on the stage, you know, you're seeing lineup after lineup at festivals and you don't see yourself reflected. I, I can imagine it, it must be really difficult to then see yourself in that position later on. So the fact now that we have, you know, musicians such as yourself who are, um, you know, hopefully creating more of an inclusive scene, a scene that is um, giving everybody the chance to see themselves, you know, being successful and doing the things they want to do. Um, it's a really powerful thing for sure. Yeah, I mean, visibility um, in, well, in all walks of life is very important, um, you know, and the, you know, everyone has a story. And if you're shutting out, you know, certain people, um, you, you know, we're, we're not hearing those stories and we've become a sort of a richer, wealthier, um, you know, healthier world if we get to hear, you know, women's stories or people from um, other heritages, you know, it's, it's important. Mm, I second that. Um, if anybody has any final questions, now's the time. Um, my final question before we wrap up um, is, and I hope this isn't uh, one of those questions that's difficult to answer but I wonder in terms of the next uh the next compositional sort of focus um what sort of space you might be working in do you have any sort of rough ideas of where you want to go into next are you sort of at an open brief stage hmm. That's like for you right now well loads of things um well firstly um I'm working on my next studio album which is music that's um inspired by traditional Bahraini music so the music of the pearl divers, the women drumming groups who perform at weddings and celebrations, um, obviously um, mixed with jazz and um, electronic elements. So yeah, that's um, that's been a lot of fun. And I think that's gonna be a really great album, maybe um, quite similar to Les Saboteurs in some way, um, but obviously sort of more involved in the Bahraini side of things. Um, I'm also working on um, a, um, an EP, I suppose, um, of my side project called Electric Dreams. And that's um, a band where there's no music, it's totally free. And um, basically it's um, a drummer called Rod Youngs, amazing drummer, um, Jason Singh, who's a vocal sculptor, makes the most beautiful um, music from just his voice. 
um, and sampling his voice and making all sorts of sounds. Um, Samuel Helkvist, who is um, a Swedish guitarist and um, just, yeah, creates sounds that are from a different planet. And then myself um, and yeah, we recorded a couple of gigs um, last year and um, I'm taking those recordings and um, yeah, creating a new um, recording with those. Um, and then also, yeah, I'm, well, I haven't started, but I'm going to be starting a new composition um, for a uh, project in Germany um, later this year, well, later next year, not quite there yet. <laughs> um, and it's going to be inspired by um, uh, Zaha Hadid, who is um, an Iraqi um, architect and artist. So she creates the most, oh, the most beautiful buildings and you know I've never seen any architecture like it before it's so stunning um so yeah she's my next muse wow and they're a cool influence as well to go alongside the other you know very unique influences we've been talking about um yes I think we're out of time but thank you so much for you know. learning off, um, with us and just a huge congratulations to you as well. Um, you're a very, very inspiring composer and musician and I'm so sure that a lot of people will be following in your footsteps um, thanks to your music. So yeah, congratulations on winning the Ivan Novello Award for Innovation. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> Um, I thank you everybody for watching as well. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to get in touch with Yaz um, on socials if you have any burning questions that we didn't get to today. Um, but for now, just thanks again for joining us and Yaz, huge congrats to you and I'll catch you guys soon. Okay, thank you. <laughs>